Well, hello there. Welcome back, everybody. Tim here. I'll talk. If you listen, episode 66 zero. We're here, and it feels just like yesterday. I was doing this for the first time in my old apartment in the kitchen before I had an office, before I had a wanky new laptop, before I had a new microphone, and before many of you listened. Um, just a kid from Philly starting a podcast off of the recommendation of a few friends and to fuel a passion that I didn't really even know was there. So episode 60, 60, really happy to be here. And as promised, I'm going to do something really, really cool for episode 60. And I thought of you all when... I had this idea. So more information about that a little later on in the show. But how are you? How was everybody's holiday? Or if you're currently celebrating Kwanzaa, how is your holiday going? So I love this time of year and I hate this time of year. So to get the boo-hoo, Debbie Downer stuff out of the way, I hate this time of year because it kind of does a good job of reminding me about the things that I've lost in regards to family and the things that I don't have in regards to family. But on a brighter side, I love this time of year because there's something about that crisp winter air and call me crazy, but each season has a smell and The winter smell has to be up there with one of my favorite seasonal smells. It's just something about the crisp, cold air of winter. And there is plenty of things I don't like about winter. And honestly, honestly, winter is my least favorite of the seasons. But that doesn't mean there aren't things about winter that I dislike. So it being December 27th and us... Officially being in winter and uh, moving away from fall, um, it kind of kind of hit me, you know. When walking outside, you know, obviously it's a quarantine, so you can count how many times a day you're outside, and you know, having me, you know, me taking out the trash and having that winter crisp cold air fill my lungs. It, there's just something about it. I went on a few walks last week. I've been trying to set a goal of going on some walks. I've tried at least once a day. Uh, I haven't been really hitting that out of the park. So I said, hey, you know, three to four times a week. And today's show is about goal setting. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But just to BS with you all a little bit, being outside is just something about that winter cold air. And I want you all to tell me what's your favorite season, you know, what's your favorite season and why, and more in particular, even if you hate winter, even if you can't stand it, there has to be at least something in winter that you like, whether it's the holiday season, whether it's togetherness, whether it's something that occurs every year uh, in the winter time. Uh, let me know. Let me know what you think. Valentine's Day is in the winter. Uh, Martin Luther King's birthday is in the winter. President's Day is in the winter. There are a few other things going on, I'm sure, in your local city or town or state in the wintertime. And, of course, if things weren't crazy this year with the pandemic, I'm sure there will be, there would be a ton of different festivals or events or conventions uh, that you all could be a part of. I know there, I forget which event there is in January, but I know there's a really cool anime convention in January that my buddy Vince goes to. I know in 2016, I went to Anime Boston, and although that was in March, it was early March, so it was still winter, and let me tell you, I live in Philly, or at least right now I live in the suburb of Philly, but I grew up in Philly, and winter in Philly isn't pleasant. Winter in Boston is much worse. I mean, we're talking like a degree drop of like 15 to 20 degrees, I think it was, going from Philly to Boston. And even got to the point where in like some occasions I was underdressed. You know, it was it was crazy. But 
I do I do not envy those uh northeastern states, the ones northern, um a little bit more northern than than Philly is. So that said, um yeah, tell me tell me what's going on with you guys. Tell me, you know, how this month has treated you so far, how you dealing with if you're in PA another lockdown. Um if you're not in PA, just tell me how uh, this is the first winter uh and hopefully the only winter during the pandemic. So let me know what's going through your mind and how you've been handling it so far, especially if you got kids. It's probably been a circus at home with the little ones running around. Um and if you are living with other people, some of us have the benefit or maybe not so much a benefit, depending on what type of personality that you have, uh, of living by yourself or maybe with one other person. But there's some of us who have a house full of people and it can be really difficult when you see the same people every day. So tell me how you've been coping. Tell me how you have been holding up. I will really, really appreciate hearing from you. On another note, I am learning Spanish, everybody. If you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you may have seen the video that I put up yesterday. Um, And this is why you should follow me on Instagram or Twitter if you haven't already, just to keep an eye out for those videos, those little blurbs that I put up. Uh, Sometimes there are little snippets, you know, they're about a minute, two minutes long, and they don't quite make the YouTube cut because they're too short. But they are worthy of Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. So for Twitter and Instagram in particular, those are public. And, you know, with Facebook, I got to know you to accept you uh, as a friend. And even then, you know, I got to really like feel comfortable with doing it. You know, I had a few coworkers reach out to me for for Facebook and I denied them because I'm like, hey, I don't really know you like that, you know. But Instagram, Twitter, those are public for a reason. Uh, those were made specifically for the show in mind, and or, or with the show in mind, I should say. So it's another level of interactivity and engagement. So I encourage you all to go and follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you haven't already. And yeah, if you saw that video that I posted yesterday, you know that I have uh, taken up Spanish. And... A coworker of mine a few years back told me about an app called Duolingo because I work in a call center environment. And although I am not on the phone all day, every day, there are occasions where I do get a Spanish speaking caller. And I just want to interact on that level and also just the culture. You know, when things go back to normal and we can go out again, I would love to go to a Mexican restaurant or you know, a Dominican or, um, you know, Colombian restaurant and be able to order uh, order my, my meal in Spanish. Uh, I think that would be dope. And I think it'll help me get a little bit more in tune with the culture. Plus, it's just something fun to do. Why not? A part of the inspiration, if not a huge part of the inspiration, um, is Bill Burr. So if you've listened to the show for a while, you know that I'm a huge fan of Bill Burr. He's in my top two comedians of all time, number one being Dave Chappelle. And uh, it's funny how two of my favorite comedians are both bald. Um, (laughs) Bald game. Uh, But yeah, Bill Burr, I listen to his podcast, uh, not as faithfully as I would like to, but I do listen to to it. And uh, he just inspires me so much, and I I just love listening to him and He's learning French right now, and he's been taking it to the next level. He has been watching French movies and even asked his audience for some recommendation for recommendations for some French films. I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I just I just downloaded the Duo, uh, re-downloaded the Duolingo app. I downloaded it previously when that coworker first told me about it, and I never used it. I downloaded it, never used it. Heard Bill Burr's latest episode and was like, you know what? I want to learn. I want to learn Spanish. Let me let me try to relearn. I took Spanish in middle school and I took Latin in high school. So a little bit of history there. Obviously, some things like the pronunciation and the conjugation in particular. Let me tell you, if you are a 
natural speaker of the Spanish language. I think just like if you are a natural speaker of the English language, there's certain things you take for granted. Um, the most difficult part about Spanish for me is the conjugation, man. It's just like, not like difficult, like extreme, like on a scale of one to 10, like a full on 10. Uh, but it's up there. It's like a seven, I would say. Like it, it, it really gets me confused. So like I did my first lesson on Duolingo today. I did it this morning. I woke up this morning, barely even got out of bed. Uh, I got out of bed. Like I took my shower, washed my face, brushed my teeth, all that jazz. Then got right back in bed and said, you know what, before I get distracted with the day's events, I am going to go ahead and do this lesson. So I did the intro lesson. Uh, It was five lessons in the intro lesson. And I did pretty well. I got two answers wrong. And one of the answers that got wrong was, uh, what was the word? It was eats. The word like to eat. The verb to eat. Which is, like, if if you say he eats, it's come. And I'm probably screwing the pronunciation of that up. Um, But it's come, C-O-M-E, come. Um, But if you're you're talking about you're eating, like I, I ate, I think it's como. Or something like that. I got to check, but I'm pretty sure it's como. And it threw me off because the, it was like translate this sentence or like put it in Spanish or something, and it was like I eat apples, and I used the wrong conjugation. So I I can tell that's going to throw me for a loop. And when I hear como, I'm thinking like how like como se llama, you know, and, and you know or like you know what is your name. Um, so when I hear como, I'm thinking like what what is you know, um, so I got, I got to get used to that. I'm really excited. Um, I'm hoping I can s- stick with this. I, I, I really, I'm really hoping I can stick with this and I'm going to give you guys updates and I, I find with me, and again, later on in the episode, we're going to talk about goal setting, but I find for me personally, this is why it's so important to know yourself. We spend too much time trying to get to know other people and we don't spend enough time trying to know ourselves. This is why it's really important to know yourself. I know that when I tell people things, I put it out in the universe. In this case, it's manifesting itself as me going on Instagram and Twitter, you know, social media in general, and doing videos of my progress and everything, and and talking, even talking about it now on a podcast. It holds me accountable because now I know that other people are know, uh, other people are aware of me doing this thing. And in a way for me, for Tim, it, it's it's a level of accountability that I find I got to impose on myself. Because what happens is when I know I'm the only per- like, I'm the only person that knows that I'm doing something, I could stop at any given point in time and there's no like repercussion. Versus if I put it out there in the universe, you know, first and foremost, you got how like your reputation, how people perceive you, right? Because you say you're going to do something. But more importantly... You don't want, like, people are going to ask you about it. You know, people are going to say, hey, how's the Spanish lessons coming along? Or, you know, hey, how's this? How's that? How's this? And you don't want to be the person in the BS because you know you're BSing. You don't want to be the person like, uh, you know, I had to stop because something. What's my excuse now? I don't have enough time. I got all the time in the world. So that's what I'm doing. I like Duolingo because it's like bite-sized little chunks, little lessons. It's really, really cool. It's free. And depending on how much use I get out of it, I may actually pay for it. It's only 15 bucks, and it supports free education. Because if you look at it like this, like, hey, if you have the free version, um, the reason it's free for you is because X amount of people already paid for the paid version, so the developers can keep going. And of course, you got like advertisements and sponsors and sponsorships and all that jazz. But just the sheer fact that technically speaking, if someone else is paying for the plus membership, you are you are a part of the reason that it's free for other people. And I like that concept. I I won't necessarily always pay for a free game. Like I love free sell. I know that's the old man in me. 
but free sell is my jammy jam. That is my I love free sell. Um, um, so playing free sell, I just deal with the ads. Um, you could pay for the you know, of course, the the paid version with no ads, and you could support the game. But in my mind, I'm like, yeah, this benefits like the people making it, making it, but it doesn't benefit the user. Duolingo is unique because you can pay for it and it benefits the user. It benefits other people like you trying to learn. So depending on what other language I, I pursue, um, I think I want to pursue Russian, uh, speak Russian, um, and all the other dialects from that area. Um, I would love to speak you know, Russian. I would love to learn Japanese. So if I find myself taking on more languages or I find myself wanting to take Spanish to the next level, I very well may pay for the free, I mean, I'm sorry, the pay, uh, the paid version, the plus version. That said, um, you all should check it out. I, I put links, I'm not going to put a link in the podcast necessarily, but I do put links on my page. I put links on like my posts. I put links on like the videos. Uh, click on that link and give it a shot and see if you like it. It'll take you directly to the download, so you got to search for it. You're not quite sure how to spell it, um, and just download it. Give it a shot. You know, even if it's something that you aren't really too serious about, but you just want to try it out, it could be really cool. Even if you only learn a couple words or phrases in that new language, at least you could say, "Hey, I know how to say hello or goodbye," or in my case, "I eat apples." <laughs> Uh, at least you can say something like that in a different language, and you can say that. Uh, I've always found it really impressive when I come across people and they say, oh yeah, I speak several different languages. I think that's so cool to have the patience, discipline, and fortitude to go through all of that. Now, when you learn it as a kid, you don't get too many props from me, and the reason for that is it was probably forced on you. you. It probably wasn't necessarily your choice to learn it. You went to school, it was a class, you took it, your parents, your tutors, whomever, they imposed it on you, right? They said, you're taking this language and you took it. It was just a part of your everyday life. I give more props to the adults because adults have way more going on. They have families of their own, responsibilities responsibilities of their own, and they have much more to go on and, and going on for them. So Lord knows I'm pretty busy. You know, I got work going on. I got my personal life. I got stuff that I'm doing with my lodge, with, uh, you know, being a mason. And every little sliver of time matters, especially when you're dedicating some of that time to relaxing, you know, kicking your feet up and having a beer or some wine or something. You got to schedule time to relax when you're an adult. So I give much more kudos to the adults out there who are learning new new things like a new language that takes so much time. It's very, very time consuming. So um, I'm excited for this journey. I can't wait to see where it leads me. And I'm hoping that not only do I hold myself accountable, but I'm hoping you all hold me accountable too. Reach out to me. Um, comment on my YouTube videos. Uh, send me a message on Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Uh, if you got my phone number, text me. Just ask me. I'm asking all of you to help me. You all are my accountability partners. Just continue to reach out to me and say, hey, how's that Spanish going? Every time you talk to me, hey, how's that Spanish going? It gives me fewer reasons to BS. And I'm really excited about that. But yeah, Duolingo. I'm sure there are other apps out there. I think there's one app called Babbel. But Duolingo is one of the more accessible. It's really, really easy. I like its user interface. I, I love everything about it so far. So um and believe you me, you all know me well enough that if there was something about it I didn't like, I'd say it. I've only used it for, I think my first lesson, I spent like 15 minutes on my first lesson. Um, so my first lesson, 15 minutes, and um, not that much time with the app, but the more time I get underneath my belt, I'll be sure to tell you all some of my favorite things about it, the things that I don't like it, I like about it. And and this is really important. So as an entrepreneur in a sense with this podcast, right? I'm establishing my brand. I don't I'm not a huge fan of free advertisement if I don't necessarily see the benefit of it. But I'm all about education. I think education is next to health. If if health is the most in my book, in Tim's book, if health is the most important thing that exists, I think education is the second most important thing. So I'm all about talking about Duolingo and telling you all about my progress because I want you all to learn something too. 
and maybe you can pass some knowledge on. And if you don't get outside of your box, like, you know, if you keep doing the same thing, you only ever know English. You only ever lived in California. You only ever watched one TV station. You only ever play one video game. You'll never really know what's out there. And I think we spending we spend too much time trying to figure out what we like and not enough time on what we dislike. And in some cases, vice versa. So I think it's really, really important for us to step outside of our comfort zone. And it doesn't have to be anything extreme. Like you go from nothing to jumping off of a plane or jumping out of a plane or or skydiving or deep sea diving or something. But hey, bit by bit, you know, take a take a little little step outside your box. I think I think you'd be the better for it. So before we get rolling on over to the next subject slash topic here, I'm going to take a small break. I'm going to recharge with some caffeine and I'll see you on the other side of the commercial break. Hey, everybody, I'm back. So goal setting. So I can't quite tell you what inspired this episode or rather this topic in particular. But I did think about me and my habits and some of the people around me on why we start things and don't finish them. And I wanted to get to the psychology behind it because I'm sure, you know, we all can point to somebody that is in the same boat that we are, right? Me personally, I don't really buy too many clothes unless my friend Amanda or somebody else beats up on me like, you need some new clothes. I'm like, okay, I guess I need some new clothes, right? But I can point to somebody else who is in the same boat as me and they don't really buy clothes either. I think you could say the same thing for goal setting. We all know certain areas and certain tasks and goals that we set for ourselves, and we fall. They fall through. We don't come through. We give up. We stop short. We come up with some BS reasons as to why we don't finish. Uh, some of us try to blame any and everything but ourselves, and sometimes it legitimately is other things, you know. And I didn't want to just sit back and go, "Well, this is normal," right? Um, although it might be normal, I just wanted to understand it a little bit better because I can't speak for you all, but how my mind works is the more I understand something, the more I know about something, the more I can prepare for it. And if it's a negative thing or a toxic thing, the more I can equip myself to prevent it or at least lessen, uh, the frequency of it occurring. So I decided to do a little bit of research and I made a, a, a bit of a habit to read the articles um, on air with you all. And I think I'm going to do that. So I view that as not only me doing the research myself, I'm memorializing it so I can always come back to this and listen. But more importantly, I'm sharing it with you all and it could hit a button that maybe you all need pressed. We really need to get up off our arses and do what we have to do sometimes. And especially now more than ever, where we can't necessarily get an accountability partner just due to certain um, physical restrictions right now with the pandemic, we can either come up with some virtual accountability partners or we can discover, hey, why do I procrastinate? Why do I quit halfway through my goal? Why don't I finish this thing? Why do I struggle with motivation? I really would like to get to the bottom of this on a psychological level, or at least start to touch base with the psychological level to really understand it a little bit better. So I got a few articles here that I am going to read, and let's see if this doesn't shed a little bit of light. So I I found two articles. The first one is on one of my favorite websites, Psychology Today. And another reason I like this website is it actually shows the authors at the top of the freaking article. Y'all know I like to give people credit. And when I find an article where it has like no note on who wrote it, I feel so bad. One of my worst fears is the podcast blows up and somebody somewhere who wrote something (laughs) <laughs> hears and goes, wait a minute, that's my article. And then next thing you know, I'm in court for like plagiarism or something. Um, I know I'm being a little dramatic, but uh, fear is irrational. Uh, so this is by a doctor 
Susan K. Perry, Ph.D., and it's titled Five Ways to Finish What You Start and Why You Often Don't. These five precautions should keep you progressing toward a goal. Now, I pulled this up. I didn't read this. It doesn't look too long. So hopefully uh, we can kind of not breeze through this like on a dismissive uh, point, but hopefully we can get through the article so we can discuss it. And it begins, surely we've all done it. Start something new and then leave it unfinished. There is nothing wrong with that in itself. The trouble arises if it's a frequent pattern that causes you distress. Agreed. If it's frequent, then that's a problem. Consider the sax lessons begun and stopped. The welding class you dropped out of. The novel you intended to have done by now but haven't worked on in months or years. Or the decluttering you meant to finish on your living space. The blog you began and on which you genuinely hope to post regularly. The eating or exercise regime you stuck. Regime? Yeah, that's right. Regime. I don't know why I wanted to read that as regime. Maybe not enough caffeine. <laughs> Maybe not enough caffeine. Uh, the eating or exercise regime you started and stopped. Is there a more functional way to go about achieving goals we truly believe are worth going after? Here are a few thoughts to consider. Why we abandon projects. Starting a new project is like falling in love. It's exciting, emotionally arousing, and infused with the natural motivator of novelty. It's expensive too. Perhaps we even get obsessive about this new activity. We imagine it as all good and don't pay much attention to potential obstacles, downsides, or challenges we may soon face. Then, after some time goes by, the activity or book or lesson or relationship turns into harder work than we initially expected. It takes longer to complete than we'd hoped, or there's some tedium and drudgery involved we realize we aren't sure about the next step. Stuck, we grind into a halt. We usually don't recognize that we've essentially quit trying. No, we just put off the getting back to it until such time as we imagine it will be effortless again. This sort of procrastination may or may not be fueled by perfectionism and the fear that the next step may not be excellent enough. Regardless, Some ways of thinking frequently, almost inevitably, stop you in your tracks. There's a block, a wall, or a fear that's getting in the way. I just want to take a step back and say, ain't that the truth? Because I can tell you, just sticking with this podcast in particular, you all would never know it, but I literally have full episodes recorded that I didn't think were good enough and deleted them. So some of the weeks that, like, an episode doesn't come out it could be like legitimately i was busy or i couldn't get around to it like something happened but i think it was last week or three weeks ago i went to go record a whole episode and i recorded it it was like 35 minutes long and i'm at the point i was at like that 36 minute mark i was like man i'm just not feeling this topic i can't i couldn't even tell you what it was about which kind of proves my point, the fact that it wasn't memorable. But, like, I am not a perfectionist. I know that much. But there are things that I try to get right all of the time. Like, 100% of the time, I want it to be right. And if I'm recording an episode that I don't feel passionate about or that it just, there's no spark or no energy there, I kind of just say, screw it, and I'll, I'll delete it. And I usually record Sunday nights. And I go, you know what? I'll I'll rec- I'll come back. I'll wake up early on Monday and do it. Or, or you know what? I'll Monday night I'll record it. And then like I just never get to it. And then Tuesday comes, Wednesday comes, Thursday comes, and I'm like, you know what? I'm only, but I'm not. Sunday's right around the corner. I'll I'll just record on Sunday. And then, then I'm on Sunday recording. But at that point, I'm an episode, not an episode behind. But you know what I mean? Like I could have pumped that episode out the week earlier, but. Hasn't happened every time that I missed the episode, but definitely 
I can definitely relate to that. The article continues. Laziness may be one small piece of the problem, but few of us are lazy when it comes to doing what we love, what's easy, and what's intrinsically rewarding. How to avoid getting stuck. Here are a few actions to take before you promise yourself or others that this time you'll complete what you start. Become aware of your pattern of starting and stopping. A way to recognize a possible pattern is to list every past project you can recall. Oh my goodness. What? List every, you know what? That's a wake up call. How many of us need to see it in front of us? How many of us need to hear somebody say it? Um, that kind of reminds me, um, quick sidebar. Um, and I'm not too sure if my old DM still listens, but, and I, I, I'm eternally grateful for her um, doing this. So the first store that I ran um, in my previous job, I ran a store and we had this like back hallway that led to the back exit where we threw trash out into the dumpster behind the store. Because we had this back hallway and it wasn't accessible, like you had to go through. So here's the store layout. You came into the store. So like you're on the store floor. Think, imagine like a footlocker or something. Then you got a stock room. The stock room, obviously, employees only. It's where your stock is. And of course, the restroom and et cetera, et cetera. But beyond that, there was another exit to a hallway. And it was like this hallway storage area that led to the rear exit of the actual building. So almost like kind of like a fire exit. Because that hallway was inaccessible to anybody who didn't work at the store, like customers couldn't find their way back there. Um, we would constantly like just throw junk back there. Like I'm talking old marketing. I'm talking like stuff that like it was never actual product, but it was like, you know, cases and boxes and in some cases trash and we thought it was organized. And imagine you, you your room being a mess, but it's an organized mess. You know where everything is. So in your mind, it's neat. And my boss will always, my district manager will always get on us, me in particular, because I was the store manager, about the hallway. And honestly, it was almost kind of like, you know, um, that big sister or that mom, that aunt, you know, that guardian that mentor, whomever, telling you, like, just kind of nagging you, like, you know, clean the back room, clean the back room, clean the back room. That's kind of how I took it initially. Because in my head, I'm thinking, it's not that bad. Like, lay off, right? <laughs> and then one day, and I don't know what gave her this idea, she came and she's like, I want to show you something. She took a picture on her phone. And then she gave her phone to me. And I had looked at the picture on her phone. I'm like, oh, this is bad. And it took for me to see the picture. For me to go, you know what, this this is bad. And I think the reason for that is I saw it every day. It was right in front of my face. So I wasn't aware of it the way she was. Because she would visit my store like once every five weeks or so. So, and sometimes, you know, much more frequently than that. And she would see it. She wouldn't see it every day. She would see it once every five weeks. So she had a different perspective on it. So getting back to the article where it says, a way to recognize a possible pattern is to list every past project you can recall. That's huge. And like that'll either make you go like, oh, damn, you right? Or that could really get you down in the dumps because if you find your list is like not five things long, not three things long, but like 10, 15, 20 things long, depending on how much you can remember and how far back you want to go. It's like, damn, I gave up on a lot. But sometimes that's the wake up call you need, right? That's the wake up call you need. Wow, that's so that's powerful. That's huge. Okay, let's get back to it. Every class, resolution, language, book, or plan you have begun. Maybe a close friend can help. Write down why you started this activity and when and why you stopped. Can you determine any commonalities? Number two, research more deeply into your next project before jumping in. Learn what others have experienced when aiming towards your same goals. Don't think you'll be the first one to learn Mandarin in a month or the first to complete a novel that needs no re revising. 
or the first to lose much weight and keep it off while never feeling the least bit hungry. Yeah, that's a good point. Some people think, oh, I can do it, and they don't know what goes into it. Number three, know yourself and try to be realistic. Now, this is the point that I got. I was talking about earlier about holding myself accountable. If you're not particularly reality-based by nature, it may be a useful trait to work on. Setting goals that you can't possibly achieve while insisting you can and you will merely sets you up for failure. Point four, make a timeline or write out a set of steps toward your goal. Adding structure to your plans can really help. So many words a day, so much time per week promised to this activity, and so on and so on. It's not successes you're counting at this point, but rather specific efforts you can realistically make. One of, the, one of my favorite areas um, of goal setting for my team at work, um, hopefully it'll happen a little bit more, because uh, my position at work is really weird. Because I'm a trainer, so it's like um, I can set goals for people from a training perspective, but I can't really set goals for people from like like a supervisory perspective. But my previous line of work, I would set goals for people, and one of the goals, that, one of the uh, things that go into goal setting, not only for yourself but for other people, is uh, realistic, like tangible metrics. So something you can measure. So one of the requirements for goal setting is, can you measure this metric? Like, can you look at it and go, hey, for, for example, you can look and, saw, and see how many pounds you lost, like how much weight you lost in week one or week two or whatever. Um, you can look and see how many lessons a day you took on Duolingo. You, you can go back and look at that. Like, it's, you can track it. It's traceable. You can go back and point to it. But there are certain things like, um, hey, I want to start my own business. Well, you need to come up with goals that like you can measure. You can go, well, hey, if I want to start my own business, I need to do research on what like licenses or what certifications or what laws I need to be aware of. And then you can set a goal like, all right, well, I'm going to read one article a week or I'm going to dedicate, you know, two hours a week to research this or whatever the case may be. That's how you set, like, attainable, measurable goals. Um, here's the fifth point. Ensure your main motivation is intrinsic. Do you really want to do this for personally me meaningful reasons? Or do you think finishing your book will get you lots of money or prestige or the equivalent? If you can find pleasure in, in the doing, in the learning, you won't get as anxious when things take longer than expected. That's true. Of course, maybe you should consider quitting on purpose without a sense of failure. For more on this, see my upcoming post about quitting. Okay, so she has a post about quitting. Oh, and she's on Twitter, Bunny Ape. I might follow her. I tell her I read her article on psychology today. But yeah, that's that's some really cool uh, points and good bring up. So just to recap these points here, it says uh, become aware of your pattern of starting and stopping. Uh, research more deeply into your next project before jumping in. Uh, know yourself and try to be realistic. Um, make a timeline or write out a set of steps toward your goal. And finally, ensure your main motivation is intrinsic. That's so powerful. A part of the reason I think I enjoy doing the podcast is because it's so fulfilling. I feel like I'm talking to extended family. I'm talking about things I'm passionate about. I'm talking about things I would go to. Um, if, if you're a fan of the podcast and you've been listening for a while, you know that this is basically a child of the discussions my buddy Ryan and I would have every week at our favorite bar. So these are conversations I will be having with people anyway. Whether it be you know my buddy Chuck or Ryan or Amanda or a lodge brother or you know heck sometimes a bartender or Uber driver before the pandemic, these or even somebody you bumped into at the bar, I would do karaoke every week and go into the bar and bump into people and um, you know obviously the drinks get the flowing, those social barriers come down and all types of topics come out so. I think that's a part of the reason why I genuinely enjoy the podcast. These are conversations I would have anyway. So that's the 
intrinsic piece of it. So hopefully this uh, not only helps me, but helps you all. And there was a second article that I was able to pull up. And I've never heard of this website, but it talked about a Harvard study. So I am going to get into this uh, article right on the other side of this break. I'll be right back. Alrighty, I'm back. So this website that I never heard about, um, it's called wonderlustworker.com or wanderlustworker.com. W-A-N-D-E-R-L-U-S-T worker, W-O-R-K-E-R. Dot com and this came up in my research. It, it talked about a Harvard study uh, when it came to goal setting. So this one is a little bit um, lengthier than the previous Psychology Today article, but I think we'll be just fine. I think we can get to this uh, no problem, and uh, hopefully it won't be boring. So this is one of those articles to really touch on my pet peeve of not listing the author. I have no idea who the author is. So I can't give them credit, uh, but let's uh, let's go. Let's dive on in. It says the Harvard MBA Business School study on goal setting. In 1979, a group of researchers supposedly decided to conduct a goal setting study on the Harvard Business School graduating class to assess how written and planned for goals affect later outcomes in life. This Harvard MBA study on goal setting is referenced often on the web, but the details are usually murky or confused. Since so many have referred to this study, I wanted to demystify and dispel any confusion surrounding it. Oftentimes, people confuse this study with another often talked about study on the web that was conducted in 1953 at Yale University. This study was similar to the Harvard Goal Setting Study. However, back in 1996, Lawrence, I'm going to butcher this last name, Tabak, T-A-B-A-K. Lawrence Tabak debunked that study in a Fast Company article, claiming that it had appeared in the middle of one of the world's most renowned motivational speakers, Zig Ziglar's best-selling videos. That study looks nearly identical to the Harvard MBA study. Tabak was unable to verify the Yale study after attempting to track the sources down. Not even Yale University itself was able to verify the study by researching its vast annals of information and literature. That's saying something. So did the 1953 Yale study exist or was it simply concocted by motivational gurus to excite people about the importance of goal setting? The Harvard MBA study on goal setting. Well, Maybe the 1953 Yale study on goal setting didn't exist, but what about the Harvard Business School MBA study on goal setting? Did that exist? Well, plenty of people have debunked that as well. One researcher debunked both studies while claiming to have conducted her own that reinforces reinforces the importance of setting and planning for goals. The 1979 Harvard MBA study on goal setting analyzed the graduating class to determine how many had set goals and had a plan for their attainment. Interestingly enough, the results of the 1979 Harvard MBA study are exactly identical to the supposed 1953 Yale study. In the Harvard Business School MBA study on goal setting, the graduating class was asked a single question about their goals in life. The question was this, have you set written goals and created a plan for their attainment? Prior to graduation, it was determined that 84% of the entire class had set no goals at all. 13% of the class had set written goals but had no concrete plans. 3% of the class had both written goals and concrete plans. The results? Well, You've likely somewhat guessed it. Ten years later, the 13% of the class that had set written goals but had not created plans were making twice as much money as the 84% of the class that had set no goals at all. That's crazy. 
However, the apparent kicker is that the 3% of the class that had both written goals and a plan were making 10 times, get the hell out of here, are you kidding me? 10 times as much as the rest of the 97% of the class. That is crazy. 10 times as much? If the study is actually true, which most people believe it not to be because there doesn't exist a single shroud of verifiable evidence, then it would be saying a lot. So basically, there's no way to tell if this study actually happened or not. But it does raise a good point. The importance of goal setting. Whether or not the Harvard MBA Business School study on goal setting is true, it does help to highlight something very important. To achieve your goals, they need to be written out and planned for. In fact, it's best to create smarter goals, which you can read about. Oh, I remember this. Um, so I took um, a mentor class at my previous job. And there was no ER. I don't know where it's smart that the ER and smarter is, but we had SMART goals, um, and it was an acronym. Let's see if I can remember it. The S stood for specific. The M stood for measurable. The A stood for attainable. Oh, I don't remember what the R was for. Specific, measurable, attainable. Oh, man. If they list it in here, I'm going to remember. As soon as I see it, I'm going to tell you that's right. But the T was like trackable or traceable, um, which is a little redundant because if it's measurable, it's trackable. But anyway, the article goes on to say, however, it isn't just about creating goals the right way and writing them down. You need to properly plan for them. One of the biggest and most important takeaways from that supposed Harvard MBA business school study on goal setting is the fact that goals need to be planned for. Without a plan, chances for success are minimal. One study by Statistic Brain, which decidedly analyzed New Year's goals, conveys a very similar fact to that Harvard business school study. Very few people achieve their goals. They claim that just 8% of people achieve their New Year's goals, with a resounded 92% that end up in failure. The study, which they seem to change the date on every year to keep current, by the way, also claims 45% of Americans usually make goals, 17% of Americans infrequently make goals, and 38% of Americans never make goals. Another interesting measure about the study from Statistic Brain was the following about how far they actually got before they threw in that proverbial towel. 75% of people made it through their first week. 71% of people made it past two weeks. 64% of people made it past one month. And 46% of people made it past six months. What does this also infer? 25% of people didn't even make it through their first week of New Year's goals. Does this sound familiar? This isn't even to say that out of all of these people, only 8% actually achieved their goals. If we're talking about 300 million people in America, and if 62% of them either usually or infrequently make New Year's resolutions, we're talking about 186 million people. If 186 million people in America are setting goals, that means that 171.12 million are giving up. That is crazy. When you put the numbers out like that, it's just it's it's crazy to see that number in front of you. That's a huge number. If you don't want to be a statistic, then you should heed the advice that's interlaced into the supposed Harvard MBA Business School study. Set goals by writing them down and create a plan. Setting goals the right way. I've posted often. See, I hate that. I've posted often. Who are you? There's nowhere on this page where I can see who you are. Um, I've posted often about goal setting in the past. I've even written a number of books on the topic. One of the most popular ones has been a book called How Not to Give Up, which was also translated into Spanish and German. In another book called Art of Persistence, I also talked a great deal about this. Okay, I'm going to pause this real quick 
And I'm going to look up this book so I can get the guy's name. How Not to Give Up. Okay. The guy or woman. Not to give up. How Not to Give Up book. Okay, let's see. Amazon is selling it. Okay, it's by R.L. Adams. R.L. Adams. Okay, Mr. Adams. Appreciate this article. Okay, getting back to the article. The point? I've talked a lot about the importance of goal setting and doing it the right way. Regardless of the truth behind the Harvard MBA goal setting study, if you want to achieve your goals, ensure that you are not, I'm sorry, ensure that you not only set them using the smarter method, but that you also create a massive action plan. When we talk about smarter goals, we're talking about goals that are primarily highly specific. You need to get really exact about what you want to achieve. Don't just say you want to be rich, lose weight, or start your own business. Get exact about it. Why you should be specific about your goals. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Why should you be specific about your goals? Well, the reason why goal setting works when it's done on paper and in the right way is because that the mind sees it believes. I think that's a typo. I think what he meant to say is, oh, no, 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 I read it wrong. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. R.L. Adams. That was on me. So let's go back. It says, well, the reason why goal setting works when it's done on paper and in the right way is because what the mind sees, it believes. Think about all the things people have accomplished in this world. It was all just once a thought. That's a good point. 100 years ago, if you told someone we would have pocket computers that could access the world's information or self-driving cars or artificially intelligent personal assistants, and any other number of today's technological conveniences, they would have told you that you were crazy. Yeah, and they would probably burn you at the stake too. But these are simply the products of our thoughts. Conceive something in the mind, then write it down on paper. But be very precise about it. But once it's written down, don't forget that you need to actually follow through with it by creating a plan and tracking your results. Specifically, Here's what you need to be doing if you want to fall in that 3% that exists in that supposed Harvard MBA study on goal setting. Number one, set a highly specific goal. The goal needs to be specific. Instead of saying you want to be rich, come up with an exact sum of money. As outlandish as it might seem to you today, it's the subconscious mind's focus on that precise number that alters much of your actions on a daily basis. If you don't write it down, It simply means you don't believe enough in the goal. Wow. How heavy did that just come, y'all? If you don't write it down, it simply means you don't believe enough in the goal. Ain't that the truth? Wow. Wow. You know what? I'm going to be real honest with y'all. And sometimes I think I'm above goals. Like in that way, I'm above goals. I like, I don't need to write it down because I know I want to do it. But no, I mean... In a way, writing it down makes you accountable. I mean, if you don't write it down and you don't have to see it and you don't have to, there's that fear of failure, right? You don't have to be constantly reminded of the thing that you didn't achieve. So there's that fear of not writing it down. But wow, this this article is deep. I'm glad I came across it. Pick the number. It can be one hundred thousand dollars, one million, ten million, one hundred million, or more. The point? Pick the exact number. And a precise time you'll achieve it. Maybe you'll say 100 million five five. I'm sorry. Maybe you'll say 100 million five years from now. Maybe you'll say 100 thousand precisely 12 months from now. No matter what it is, be specific. Also, make sure that this is a measurable number. It has to be measurable so you can track your progress. The more you can track on a finite level, the more likely you'll be able to achieve your goal. That's why it's important to be very exact and specific here. And pick the date down 
to the very day that you'll achieve this goal. Create strong enough reasons. Number two, this is the second point. Reasons come first. Answer, answers come second. Ooh, reasons come first. Answers come second. I like that. If you have a strong enough reason to achieve a goal, you'll follow through. If you don't, you'll quit. Think about it. In the past, when you really wanted something badly enough, and I mean really wanted it, didn't you do whatever it took to achieve it? The point here is to come up with reasons that go beyond the superficial. Those reasons won't work. I can't guarantee you that. Oh, I can guarantee you that. I'm butchering your article, Mr. Adams. I'm sorry about that. When the reasons are superficial, when the going gets tough, you'll get going. But when the reasons are deep and the meaning and the meanings run to the core of who you are, you'll push through. What are some examples of strong enough reasons for wanting to achieve something? Ask yourself the question until your answer equals the question. For example, if you say you want to increase your net worth by $1 billion by exactly 12 months from now, why do you want it? Do you want the extra one, one, do you want the extra $1 million in net worth for the right reasons? If you say it's because you want to buy a flashy car and a McMansion, you can forget it. If you say you want it for other deeper meanings, you just might follow through. Let's just say you want it because you want to stop struggling so much in life. Okay, that's a good start, but what doesn't run deep, but that doesn't run deep enough. Why do you want to stop struggling? Maybe it's because you've never really had financial security and you're looking to achieve that. So, security is good. Why do you want financial security? Maybe it's because you want to take care of and provide for your family. Security, family, and freedom are some good examples of deep enough reasons. But you need to put some powerful language behind those single-worded reasons. And you have to make sure that you write all of this down. It's great to have deep enough reasons, but like your goals, you need to be writing it down. So it moves you from the abstract into reality. Develop a thorough plan. This is point number three. No matter how outlandish your goal might seem to others, the only person that has to wholeheartedly believe in it at first is you. Regardless of what that goal is or why you want it, if you want to follow through, you need to create a plan. Without a plan, you're dead in the water. This doesn't mean you need to know every step you took. And as supposed Harvard MBA Business School study, if it were to truly exist, I would posit that the 3% that actually had a plan put some thought into it, but they didn't know every single step along the way. It was a general sense of direction that would have been fleshed out annually, monthly, weekly, and even daily along the way. Come up with a plan that's thorough enough so that your goals have direction. Don't be left floundering out there. How are you going to achieve those lofty goals? Create a roadmap that will take you from point A to point B. Put enough energy and enthusiasm behind this, even if it takes you days or weeks to complete. Will you start a business? If so, what kind of business? What are some of the steps you need to do along the way to starting that business? Legal requirements? Do you need an attorney, an accountant, website design, product manufacturing? What will you do? Detail out the steps no matter what they are and try to be as thorough as possible. If you're going to lose weight, buy a new house or anything else, create the steps you need to follow in order to see things through. This is an important part of achieving your dreams and without it, you might just find yourself giving up before you make any real progress. Mm, that's deeper than rap. Number four, take massive action. Having a plan is great, but if you don't do anything to see your plan through, what's the point? It's easy to see now why so few people in that supposed Harvard, he keeps saying supposed in front of every, every time he says it, um, in that supposed Harvard MBA business school study on goal setting made so much money. It's because few people not only set goals the right way and develop a plan, 
but also take massive action to see things through to fruition. You have to decide now what group you're going to fall under, then find the motivation and inspiration on a daily basis to follow through. However, in order to take action, you'll need to do things like stamp out procrastination. Procrastination, as they say, is the silent killer. It's largely responsible for the 92% of people that don't follow through with their New Year's resolutions. Also, in order to take action, you need to ensure you avoid time wasters by effectively managing your time and quitting your bad habits. If your bad habits are holding you back, you'll be hard-pressed to find the time to take massive action on a daily basis towards the achievement of your goals. We have all of these distractions in life that it's so easy to get sidetracked. From social media to in-person socializing, overindulgence in television, and everything in between, it's quite easy to veer off track. But it's important to stay the course. Keep motivated and enrich yourself with a daily dose of inspiration. If your goals are meaningful enough to you, you'll follow through. You'll do what it takes so that you can become like the 3% group in that Harvard MBA business school study and not like the other 97%. And to do that, you have to be willing to go the extra mile, so to speak. And this looks like this is the last point. Number five, manage, track, and adjust. Daily goal setting and management of your goals is important. This helps you to achieve milestones along the way to those bigger long-term goals. Daily goals are great also because it allows you to track your results along the way. For example, If you set the goal of getting out of debt to the tune of $24,000 within a 12-month period, you can come up with a monthly, weekly, and daily goals to achieve just that. $24,000 of debt paid off in 12 months means $2,000 per month. That might sound like a lot, but not when you look at things on a more finite scale. $2,000 per month is roughly $66 per day. How can you save or cut out $66 per day in expenses? How can you also earn some side income to make that number more of a reality? Again, if you're committed enough, you'll find a way. But $66 per day sounds much more conceivable than $24,000 of debt, doesn't it? So track your results by setting daily goals. Then, if you see that something isn't working out the right way, you can adjust your approach. Similar to a plane that might veer off course due to air traffic congestion, turbulence, or an oncoming storm, you have to make a shift so you can reach your goals. You can't just give up. Ain't that the truth? Okay, last paragraph. If that supposed Harvard MBA business school study teaches us anything, it's that achieving our goals is difficult, but it's not impossible. As long as we stay focused on our goals and do the work, We'll get there over time. It just won't happen overnight. Definitely, you don't expect it to happen overnight. But in time, it will happen. It's only a matter of time as long as we don't give up. So this was a really good article. Um, I stumbled across it doing some research, and it was really dope. And I think it's really important. I mean, setting the I'm, I'm recalling when I first started the podcast, And I kind of like, I did write down some things that I need and I kind of crossed them off as I got them. So it was like laptop, you know, microphone, uh, you know, audio recording software, all these different things. And I even set up some goals on like research on like what the best audio recording software is. And even on, um, you know, Spreaker hosts my podcast, even how I found my way to Spreaker, I, I did some research. There was some other um, competition out there. I know Anchor FM is one. And there was another one out there. I want to say Blueberry or something like that. But there are a ton of different podcast hosting websites. And I found my way to Spreaker. And, you know, it was from writing everything down and doing the research and finding the time to do it. For me, back in the day, it was bus rides. I caught the bus to and from work, and I realized, like, hey, when I'm on a bus, um, the only thing I really do is listen to music and maybe look at some articles on my phone and or daydream out the window. 
So I said, hey, I can use that time to be productive. And I did, I use it to um, do some research. But a lot of the times that I would daydream on a bus or read an article or get distracted, it's because I forgot. And I found that when I wrote the goal down, I remembered to do it. So a lot of procrastination isn't necessarily out of like laziness or fear. Sometimes it's just out of forgetfulness. So that was huge. Um, speaking of setting goals, I have a friend of mine, um, actually Jaleesa. She was featured on uh, an episode uh, regarding if black men support black women. She actually just opened up her own business. So I'm going to try to get her back on the show to talk about it and talk about her journey there. But I'm sure she had to set goals. I'm sure she had to write some stuff down and had to do some research. And um, it was huge for her. I'm really, really proud of her. So um, to see a strong young black woman um, and anybody for that matter, even if it was a 90-year-old white man, um, start their own business is huge. But the reason I'm proud of Jaleesa in particular is outside of just knowing her, but it's really important that we take life by the horns and we steer it in a direction that we want to go. And Jaleesa was able to do that, or at least start to be able to do that with her business. So shout out to Jaleesa and congratulations. I plan on supporting the business and supporting her. And let me say this while I'm on a uh, topic of support. I know this has nothing to do with what we just talked about, but black people, please stop asking for a discount. Okay, please stop asking for a discount from your homie, your friend, your mom, whoever, from their business. The best way to support their business is to pay full price, okay? And if you are going to ask for a discount or to get something for free, you need to make it worth their while. Maybe you advertise for them. Maybe you get some stuff for free and you share their product for them. Maybe you champion for them and you post a picture on your uh, social media to support them. But please stop. You know what? I'm going to do a whole maybe video series about why asking for a discount does more harm than good. You may think you're helping yourself, but you could potentially put that person out of business. Now, it's up to that person to say no, but you could potentially put that person out of business. And now, now look, you don't have a resource anymore because you kept asking for a discount. So if we want to see our black brothers and sisters succeed, we need to stop asking for a discount. So stop asking for a discount or a quote unquote hookup really bugs me really really bugs me but um we're not going to turn this to a ranting episode but yeah you know better you know who you are um so yeah that's pretty much the podcast y'all um i hope you enjoyed the episode i really 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 do um there's one last point i want to talk about i'm going to mention and uh, i'm gonna take one last break uh pay some bills and i'm going to come back with one small update, and that'll be it. So sit tight. I'll be back right after this. All right, gang, welcome back. So um, I want to announce two things, give you some updates, and then I'm going to let you all go. So the first thing is I had my first international guest on from Canada. Uh, His interview is going to be coming out very, very soon. I'm still working on it. And I can't wait for you all to hear it. It's It was super dope. It's a huge step uh, for me personally and for the show. Uh, it was huge. I remember having um, Adam on, who's an author, and my friend Maud on in the past. And they were both residents of California. And I was like, okay, great. We're getting outside of the local area here. Um, I remember having other guests on from different states. But this was huge. And we joked uh, about it in the interview a little bit about how Canada is right next door. um, And we always say international, but hey, technically it is. And it was a huge, huge step for the show. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be out shortly. Um, I'm just still working on that. But for episode 60, so for hanging in there with me for 60 huge episodes, I want to do something really, really special. I would like to gift some merchandise. So I'm going to give you some I'll Talk If You'll Listen merchandise. Um, And it's something I think you'll appreciate. It's really nice. And in order to uh, qualify, uh, it's going to be kind of like a drawing or giveaway. Um, All you got to do is reach out to me, whether text message, Facebook messenger, Instagram, you know, messenger, or Twitter DM, however you choose to. Uh, Reach out to me and just tell me, 
which episode featured your favorite guest? So who was your favorite guest that I have on the show? Uh, 60 episodes, uh, there was a lot of growing, not just for me, but also my guests. And the cool thing about my guests is a lot of them are listeners. Uh, so it was really, really cool to have listeners on the show. And I want to get some feedback from you all. So which episode featured your favorite interviewee? Just let me know. That's all you got to do. Uh, we're going to keep this going for a while. I'll be sure to announce when I will be drawing. But uh, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of time and just let me know. And uh, whoever wins, I'll be selecting a winner at random. And whoever wins will be getting some I'll Talk If You'll Listen merchandise. And I think you'll really like it. So that said, keep an eye out on the social media for updates on the show. Follow me on Instagram, y'all, so y'all can get some really cool videos in your eyeballs. I think you'll really, really like it. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your December. I will be talking to you all online, so I won't say if I won't hear from you, if I don't hear from you, have a happy new year because I will hear from you. But if you don't follow me, then I won't hear from you. So happy new year. Uh, I hope you set some goals for the new year and I hope you follow through just to keep in mind what we talked about in today's show. With that said, everybody, have a great night. Enjoy the rest of your day, your week, your month, your year. And I'll keep talking if you'll listen. Take care.